Our next speaker is George Guimaraes, who is a vegan dietitian and animal rights activist from Brazil. He is a frequent lecturer at universities and events for the general public and contributes regularly as a writer. George is a uh, the founder of the Brazilian animal rights organization VEDAS, and he also organizes the National Animal Rights Gathering in Brazil. In his presentation now, George will talk about various aspects of the vegan nutrition and the important aspects of healthy vegan diet. He is happy to answer all your specific questions at the end of his presentations. So I will not be talking about the subject that I like the most, which is animal rights on this session, but we're going to be talking about animal rights in Brazil uh, tomorrow. And I always like to think that it's best to talk about animal rights than about the transversal issues like health or environment, but it's also important that we have the information to be able to argue with those who might bring up the issue and also for our, our own so we can look after our own health, of course, right? So there, there are no breakthroughs here being, being presented, no scientific news, but uh, the basics for those who might be starting on a vegan diet or who have a lot, of, a lot of questions or who just need answers to be debating with people in the streets that will bring it up. So uh, a vegan diet does have a lot of advantages, the main one being the prevention of chronic and degenerative diseases. Uh, that means cancer, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, obesity, the diseases of affluence or the diseases of uh, of extra eating and not not, not less eating, right? And it does bring better quality of quality of life and better longevity. So what we see with with the vegetarian populations, and we we do have enough data now to start looking at the vegan populations, but most of the data will point to the vegetarian populations in general, of lacto and vegans mixed, that they not only live longer, but they also live with better quality of life, especially exactly because they uh, are not suffering from the diseases, the, the chronic and degenerative diseases that will affect people at uh, another age. So the disadvantages is just a matter of actually information or adapting your routine. There's no real disadvantage to a vegan diet other than uh, becoming less social or you know, not knowing what to eat now, but it's all things that with time we learn to, to get along with, right? And uh, you, you either change your social circle or you learn how to deal with, with the issues that, that come up because, of, because you're different now and you're eating different. So it's not really a disadvantage, it's just something that needs to be overcome or you, you need to get, get adapted to. Uh, those advantages are because uh, the vegan diet is low in saturated fat, it, it has no cholesterol at all, right? Uh, a novo lacto diet will have some cholesterol, a vegan diet will have zero cholesterol. Uh, it is high in, in antioxidants, it is high in fiber, and it is high in other protective substances like phytonutrients. And the disadvantages from, from a, a very specific nutrients that need to be taken care of is vitamin B12, the omega-3s, and vitamin D, iodine, and selenium might be a problem depending on, on the region of the world where you live, and we're going to be looking more closely into those. It does have usually a lower calcium intake than uh, a diet that includes dairy products, but it doesn't mean that it is low. It's just lower, relatively lower if you compare to a diet that has dairy, but it doesn't mean that it's lower than it should be. So it's still adequate, right? And it's usually adequate in protein, iron, and, and zinc. Not, not a big deal for, for those, as long as we keep it varied and with the, the sources that we'll be discussing in a moment. Yeah, so typical vegans will have a lower body weight, uh, we have a lower radio of bad to, to good cholesterol, we have a lower total cholesterol, and the studies shows that they will live two to six years longer than the general population. And now let's look at those the nutritional concerns that I mentioned before, which are mainly, uh, some of them are not real concerns, but just myths, like, like protein, iron, iron and, and, and calcium, and, and we what we really need to take care of is vitamin B12 and 
and omega-3 fatty acids. So by consuming uh, enough calories, this is the one message that we need to get when, when it comes to protein. If you're consuming enough calories from your food, and your food is coming from varied sources, from sources that also include good protein sources, you don't need to worry uh, beyond that with protein. So, uh, because most foods will have enough protein, what we need is 10% of our calories in the form of protein. And most foods do have over, oh, sorry, the food names are in Portuguese there, but uh, you can see it's broccoli, alfalfa sprouts, tofu, lentils, cauliflower, chickpeas, beans, wheat, corn, uh, barley, and almonds, and then we, we get uh, we get to 10 percent when we're talking about potatoes, carrots, brown rice, and only the fruits are below the 10 percent line. So we're going to be talking about protein quality in a moment. But when it comes to quantity, any food that is not a fruit, and of course that is not a refined food, we 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 don't we're not considering alcohol or or sugar or or white flour here. But any food that is a whole food and it's not a fruit, we have more than 10% of its calories in the form of protein. So if those are the foods that you're mainly eating and you're getting enough calories, calories that means that you're getting enough protein as a consequence. Okay. But then comes the question of quality, right? Because not all protein is the same. Protein is formed by amino acids. So let's say that the amino acids are the, the small bricks or the small parts that will form the wall or the big, the larger piece, which is the protein. So some amino acids are called essential amino acids. Uh, the term essential means that it has to come from a diet. Our body, our bodies cannot synthesize it, so it has to come from from your diet. So those are the essential amino acids. So when we're talking about the quality of the protein you're, you're eating, we're talking about getting. Uh, all the, the assortment of the essential amino acids. Uh, when that issue started being discussed in the, in the 70s, uh, there was this big concern about protein complementarity or you know, just making sure you're getting all the complicated math so that you get all the essential amino acids. But the knowledge that we have then, we had then, led us to think it was something complicated, and somehow that still prevails. And and some sectors, or some people will still think it is a complicated thing, uh, but it's not, right? So if we consider two main sources, uh, uh, the two main sources, which are legumes or, or pulses, like well, as you'd say in England, uh, and nuts and seeds. Those are the main protein sources, and these sources are complemented by cereals. As we saw on the chart, cereals are not an extra, a super source of protein. Right? Cereals are like below the 17% line. Uh, we have the, the 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 nuts and the legumes or the pulses above that line. But cereals do have one key that is important because cereals will bring one amino acid that uh, is the methionine, which will complement uh, the, the amino acid that is lacking on those very good sources of protein. Right? So in quantity, nuts, seeds, legumes, pulses are great sources of protein, but they do like, like one, one ingredient, one amino acid, which is this amino acid called, uh, called methionine, and which is very present, very much present in cereals. And cereals, on the other hand, we lack lysine, or lysine, not sure how to pronounce this in English, and uh, which is exactly what is lacking on, on, on the beans, on the legumes. So they, they are a good, a good combination when you have cereals and, and legumes or, or nuts. So by legumes or pulses, I mean beans, lentils, peas, chickpeas, uh, soy, and, and soy products, right? All these grains that uh, look... Uh, that, uh, that look more beany, right? When when talking about cereals, they're longer grains, uh, like rice, oat, barley, quinoa, amaranto, or, or corn, and nuts and seeds. Of course, they are more oily seeds, right? So it's hard to it's it's easy to distinguish them. Right? Yeah. If it's if you're in doubt, so just think if you take a bean and smash it in a piece of paper, would it stain? 
that paper with oil? No, you would not, like a raw bean, but uh, an almond or, or a macadamia or a pistachio that would leave a stain on that paper because it has more oil, right? So then you know it's, it's a nut. And not only nuts, but also seeds. I saw we were talking about, also, when I say nuts and seeds, I mean also sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, uh, uh, flax seeds. Those are also in that category. So what are the strategies to guarantee that we're getting enough protein? Uh, guarantee you're getting enough calories. How do you know that? Are you losing weight? Maybe you're losing weight because you had to. You, had, you just became a vegan and you had some extra weight on, then it's natural that you're going to be losing some weight until you, you, you come to, to your balance. But then if you continue losing weight after that, that's because you were, after you came to an ideal weight, if you continue to lose weight, that means you were losing more than, than you should. But if you're already close to your ideal weight and you're losing too much weight, that means you're not getting enough calories. So it's easy, it's an easy index, right? You know by your weight control if you're getting, if you're getting too little of it. And by, which, by the way, is usually the challenge, right? On a vegan diet, the challenge is getting enough calories. Uh, the risk is getting too few calories. Okay, so we see most people having a problem with getting too few calories. So you do need to uh, eat a greater volume when you become a vegan. It's natural. Some people will say, oh, no, no, I've been trying this vegan diet and you know, I just feel empty all the time. That's because you're eating too little. Uh, because you do need to, to change your, your, your standard, or what's the word? Your pattern, right, of what, what, is, what is a good meal, what, what amount of food is a good meal, because vegetables are, vegetable foods are less concentrated in calories because they have more fiber, they have more water when we compare to, to, to animal foods. So you do need to increase the, the volume of what you're eating so you get the same amount of calories. And I'm talking about calories all the time, but of course when we say calories, there's other nutrients that will be coming along with that, right? Because you're eating more, so you'll be also eating with that greater volume, you're also eating more calcium and, and more zinc and, and everything else. Because you increase the volume. Uh, of, for protein now, so of, avoid uh, the, the, the super refined foods, because then of course you're getting empty calories, so that doesn't count. Right now I'm, I'm maintaining my weight, I'm getting enough calories, but those are calories that came with no protein value because they were just sugar or refined flours. So that doesn't count. So just stick in with mostly with the, with the non-processed foods. That's a good strategy. So let's, now let's talk about calcium. And we see that the main sources of calcium are the same sources of protein, right? Legumes and nuts. And those are complemented by the dark uh, dark green leafy vegetables, the fruits, especially dried fruits, not because they get more calcium when, they, when, when they're dried, when they're dehydrated, but because you're more likely to eat 40 raisins than you are to eat 40 fresh grapes, right? Because the volume is, is smaller. So it might be, especially for uh, women who are pregnant, for example, that need an extra calcium uh, intake, Dried fruits might be a good strategy because then you can eat more fruits in, in, a, in a smaller volume. And you can always get it from fortified foods, of course. So many times orange juices or, or vegetable milks, uh, different foods will be fortified with calcium and other nutrients. Now, uh, calcium, uh, we usually think of calcium and then we think of osteoporosis and then we think bone health. But it's not only calcium that matters for your bone health. There are other factors, and a vegan diet is an advantage when we consider all those other factors. For example, uh, a diet that is rich in potassium will give you a better calcium balance. That means your body will make a better use of that calcium. It's going to uh, uh, expel less calcium. It's going to keep more calcium in the system if your diet is also rich in potassium or, or, and or vitamin K. And those are present in vegetable foods, not in animal foods. So if you're eating a, a, a vegan diet, you're eating more, you might be eating less, less calcium, not less than enough, but less relatively. But you're eating more of those substances that help you keep a good calcium balance, like vitamin K, uh, potassium. And for vitamin D, that might be a problem 
because some animal products would be a good source, vegetable products rarely, so you want to make sure you have enough exposure to sunlight uh, in this region or even northern Europe. It might be a problem because uh, you're not getting enough sunlight uh, uh, during uh, winter, winter months, so you might want to consider a, a vitamin D supplement. Make sure it's D2 because D2 is the vegan source. If your vitamin D is D3, then it's not, it's not vegan. Okay, so it's got to be vitamin D2. Look, sometimes the label won't tell you, so you have to write the manufacturer, or but many times they, they will tell you. Not hard, it's not hard to find them. You can buy them on websites and all that. Uh, I'll wait to know if you're getting enough sunlight. Uh, the sun has to be at 45 degrees. That means your shadow is as long as, as you were, as tall as you were, right? Because uh, some regions in Europe, you're going to get sun, might never get above that. Never get that high, right? During, during some months, so that means it's no good, right? But if it's at least 45 degrees, then you need 15 to 30 minutes exposure, depending on on your skin tone. And also, vegan diet is moderate in protein. The more protein the person takes as excess protein, uh, the worse the calcium balance. So too much protein is not good for calcium balance, and you're more likely to be getting excess protein on a on an omnivorous diet, right? Not on a vegan diet. Of course, you can also get too much protein on a vegan diet, but you're less likely to. Uh, another protective factor, or we're actually talking about the same nutrient, is the phosphorus calcium balance. So the more phosphorus you have in, uh, in, in, in your diet, the worse it is. So we talked before that potassium is, is a, a, an advantage, right? It's a protective element for your calcium balance. Now we're talking about phosphorus. Okay, phosphorus is bad for your calcium balance. And meats are good sources of phosphorus. So, for example, beef, red meat, has 15 phosphorus for every calcium. That's not too much phosphorus for every calcium that, that you're getting in that one food. Uh, white meat didn't change much. Okay, it's still very bad for your calcium balance. Now when you look at vegetables, we have some that are too high, in, no, not too high, are a little high in phosphorus, some that are a little higher in calcium, but they're like two to one, or one to two and a half. So that means that you, you can combine one with the other, right? You, you have one peach and one broccoli, you're pretty close to balance. Right? That, that'll, that'll come out to two to 2.5, so that's pretty much close to a one to one relation. But now if you're having beef, beef then you, have, you gotta have 15 times as much broccoli, so that, so that you can balance that and get you a one-to-one -one phosphorus to calcium balance. The point is, here is, uh, animal foods are not good sources of the protective substances, protective nutrients, potassium, vitamin K. Uh, a vegan diet does have that, and it is low in phosphorus and low in sodium, which is embedded into animal foods. Right? So, it's not a, a scientific statement to say that vegans would need less calcium in their diets because they're, because they're not losing as much calcium. We don't have enough studies to make such a statement, but uh, it is a, a hypothesis that we might actually need less calcium in our vegan diets because we're not losing calcium due to other characteristics of the diet. But do try and, and get enough calcium, which is, which is not... Uh, that hard to do as long as you have a varied diet. Now iron, check this out. The iron sources are the same sources as the calcium sources, right? Foods do not as usually be fortified with iron as they are fortified with calcium because it can be dangerous to supplement iron for those who don't need it. But when we look at the non-fortified sources, the natural sources, it's the same as calcium. So if you're eating legumes and, and, and nuts, you're already taking care of the protein, the calcium, and the iron, and other things. And then you add the dark green leafy vegetables and the fruits, and you're taking care of iron and calcium extra. So it is a good idea to mix uh, your, your iron sources with a source of vitamin C. Okay, and vitamin C is not only citric, Fruits, right? So most people would tend to, to think that way. Uh, anything that looks fresh and lively, you know, when you're looking at a, a leaf of lettuce or a tomato, and it still seems 
looks alive, looks lively. Uh, it still has a lot of vitamin C. When it starts you know, getting weird and, uh, uh, what's the word in English? Uh, not, anyway, the, the texture changes, the way it looks changes, you, you can tell uh, now it's starting to die. You know, and that, that means it's not, it's not, uh, does not have any active vitamin C anymore because it has used all that it had to protect it from, because the, the vitamin C is in that food, but it's reacting with, with the light, it's reacting with oxygen. So that food has a, had a storage of vitamin C, right? and then it is exposed, and, but it's not, it does not have the nutrients it needs anymore to, to continue its metabolism. So it's just gonna use the reserve that, that it had. So when it starts, you know, not, not decompose, decomposing, but just doesn't look lively anymore, then it's not a good source. So don't think only of citric fruits. Anything that, that is a live food is, is likely to be a good source of, of vitamin C. Could even be a, a, a vegetable, not a fruit, like, like a, a kale or other leaves. So that's, that's it for iron. And another good hint about iron is to try not to have it all at the same meal. Same thing uh, both for both iron and calcium. It's going to work the same way, and the food sources are the same. Uh, you can't think, okay, I'm going to have all my iron sources at lunch or at breakfast, because the body will absorb less if it is offered more at the same time. Okay, the body is sensitive to the quantity that is offered. If too much iron is put into your digest digestive tract, the body is going to absorb a, a lower percentage. Of course, it's going to absorb more in absolute numbers, but it's going to be making a, a less efficient use because in percentage, it's going to absorb less. So try and have it you know, along your, during the day, not in a single meal. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acids, many times neglected, so very important to be considered. Let me just see how I'm doing with time. Half an hour. Okay. Usually, vegans and vegetarians, we have a low... Uh, uh, omega-3 intake, a very low omega-3 intake, actually. Uh, a common ratio is 20 to 1. What we need is 4 to 1, and I'm talking about uh, 4 omega-6 to 1 omega-3. Okay, so 6 is on that side. We have 4 pieces of 6 for every piece of 3. We still need more of the omega-6, but sometimes we get a, radio, a ratio of 20 omega-6 for every omega-3 in the diet. That's, too much. That's actually common. Sometimes you'll see 32 to 1 uh, on a diet. So the solution is to avoid the super omega-6 concentrated sources and to include the omega-3, because then you're lowering the omega-6 and you're uh, increasing the, the omega-3, and then you come to a, a good radio. So what, is a, 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 if you, a, what are good sources? Uh, if you're going to use as a table oil, as you would use olive oil, olive oil, by the way, should never be heated, Otherwise, it becomes a saturated fat. So olive oil is a is a oil that you use at the table. You, you can put on a hot soup, but at the table, right? You're not going to be boiling that soup with olive oil because then you you tr you're transforming it into a saturated fat. Uh, but uh, olive oil has nothing to do with omega three or six. It's omega nine, so it's another category. But flaxseed is the same thing as olive oil. It is an omega three source, but it, it also should never be heated. When you buy extra virgin olive oil or extra virgin flaxseed oil, it's called extra virgin because there was no heat applied to, to the extraction process, right? So you're paying more because it was cold pressed and then you're gonna you know, cook with it then. It's no good. So the strategy here is quite simple. Add some flaxseed to your diet. Could also be hemp seed uh, or chia, 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 I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Chia seed, C-H-I-A, chia, chia seed oil. Uh, are all similar sources uh, as far as their omega-3 uh, ratios go. So when you put in flaxseed, you're, doing, um, you, you're adding a balance which is one to four. So it's one of the bad guys to four of the good guys. We still need more of the bad guys, right? We need four omega-6 to every one omega-3. But when you put uh, the flaxseed oil, you're, you're shifting it this way. So that, because maybe your diet was at 20 to one, so you put a super strong omega-3, and then it's actually going to bring it to a balance which might end up at 4 to 1. So uh, I'm not saying that you, I'm just uh, clarifying that we don't want to have just the flaxseed. We don't want to have the 1 to 4 radio. 
we want Forge 1, but the flaxseed is like a supplement that you're adding that will help balance the other oils, which are the omega-6 oils. They are oils that are usually present in the diet, like corn oil, for example, or sunflower seed oils, uh, or uh, soy oil is also high in, in, in omega-6. So processed foods or usually the, the, the oil that people will use to cook at restaurants are those less expensive oils. So you want to then at home add some flaxseed uh, to make sure that you're countering that balance. Okay? So most people will say, well, 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 but I heard that, that sunflower oil is actually a healthy oil, right? And it is. It is for meat eaters right? because it has so much omega-6 and because meat eaters will have the opposite problem. Right? They are eating more than enough omega-3s because it's present in animal foods. So they need the sunflower oil, which is high in omega-6, to counterbalance that. We vegans, I mean, and even ovolacta vegetarians, we're having the opposite problem. So we want to avoid the sunflower and the corn oil and the soy oil and add the canola for if you're going to heat it or the flaxseed if you're going to eat it raw, non-heated. Okay, other, another uh, high omega-6 and bad oil is sesame and, and peanut. So if you're having peanut butter, there's peanut oil in there, right? So if you're having tahini, there's sesame oil in there. So that's why, so you, but you don't want to stop eating tahini, which is sesame paste, right? Uh, with, because it's a good source of protein, it's a good source of calcium, it's a good source of iron. But then you add the flaxseed, and that will bring it to, to balance. Okay, let's move on to, to, to vitamin B12, because I want to leave some, some space for, for Q&A. Uh, vitamin B12 is not found on plant foods, okay, period. Uh, we, from time to time, there, there will come a new research that they found vitamin B12 in alfalfa sprout roots or on that, that seaweed or on spirulina, or that particular brand of chlorella. And, and then when you try to reproduce that, you, you, don't, you cannot confirm that. Right? So another study we tried to reproduce that, you not confirm, but then the news has broken already, right? and people are eating alfalfa sprouts for, for vitamin B12, but it was probably, it was contaminated with bacteria that produced B12. Uh, so every now and then there will be some news. It, you know, it makes the news within the vegan community. Oh, now we have a, a vegan source of vitamin B12 because we want it so bad that to find a, a source of vitamin B12. And then uh, a new research will, will prove that wrong, but then the damage might, might be done because people are already thinking that they have a vegetable source. Why do I say it's a damage? Because it's, it's a serious question that can bring serious consequences. And it's very simple to solve, you just use a supplement or a fortified food on a regular basis. Uh, why do we want so much to find a, a, a why, why does the you know, vegan community want so much to prove that there's a vegan source of vitamin B12? Just kind of prove that a vegan diet is natural, right? But we don't need to prove that, so that, that's the point, right? It, we, we don't need to prove that a vegan di a diet uh, is natural from that point of view because uh, we are not natural to our environments. The reason why we're not consuming vitamin B12 is not because the vegan diet is not natural to our species, which you might conclude, right? Because this is a diet that doesn't have everything my body needs, so it's, it's unnatural. But uh, our, the, source of, the real source of vitamin B12 is bacteria. And if we were living in the environment where our species was meant to, to be living, where we evoluted, which is a, a wild environment, then we would be eating a lot of bacteria, right? Food wouldn't be coming from a pack, water would, wouldn't be coming from a faucet, we, we, we wouldn't be you know, brushing our teeth and washing our hands and taking ant antibiotics eventually uh, and all that. So animals in nature, uh, even, even animals in captivity, but uh, they, they're, they're not having hygienic habits. So you don't need to supplement cows with, with vitamin B12 because they're still eating from the ground. You don't need to supplement chimpanzees or staying in a zoo because people say, oh, but those chimpanzees are not in a wild environment and, and they're not supplementing with vitamin B12, but they still have the, the same habits, right? They're eating food with their hands, they're picking their nose or uh, in the miserable lives that they're living at, at the zoo or at the circus, but still they're in contact with bacteria, but we want our food to be uh, uh, 
sterilized. I'm not saying that we should eat food that is contaminated. We should eat food that is non-contaminated and take a vitamin B12 supplement. It's simple. It's not, it's not stating that your vegan diet is unnatural. So, because uh, a lot of people will be stubborn about that. No, I, I'm going to be 100% you know, vegan and not take any vitamin B12 to prove that this can be done. It does not need to be proved. It's, it is okay. You, you, you do so many other things that are not natural, right? Using a cell phone is not natural. Riding a car is not natural. So why would you going to be stubborn with the B12? So uh, if you're starting from a, 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 a good vitamin B12 status, so if you're not deficient already, uh, uh, a maintenance dose is 1,000 uh, micrograms twice a week. Okay, so that's 2,000, but preferably divided in two uh, different intakes because just like iron, vitamin B12 will be very much affected by the amount that you consume uh, at once. If you're going to take a daily dose, say from a, from a, a fortified food, and you're going to have it every day, then it's 10 micrograms is enough. You know, check the label. If it has 10 micrograms, and if you're going to have it every single day, that food, then that should be enough. Why is it so much more? It's like you know, tens of times more if you're going to take it in a single dose, because the body will, will reduce its absorption that much if it comes at, at a, in a single time. Um, I think pretty much covered that. Yeah, well, and now if you are deficient in B12, if you're already deficient in B12 and want to correct that, then it depends on how deficient you are. It might be corrected with a higher oral dose, or you might need an injection, that, which can be prescribed by uh, a medical doctor. I don't know, it depends on the country, right? If it has to be a medical doctor to prescribe it or not. But do check your status. Uh, if you're not having any, simple, any symptoms, not like you need to check it, you can just start supplementing. But if you're having issues with your memory, if you're having issues with uh, feeling uh, fatigued, you're feeling tired, uh, uh, if you're, uh, what's the word in English? Appetite, if you're, if you're experiencing appetite loss, that could also be a vitamin B12 deficiency. Uh, more, uh, uh, the symptoms will, will progress to numbness at, at your fingertips, toes and, and fingers, and loss of balance. And then after usually many years, like three, four or five years uh, of deficiency, you might start developing schizophrenia or paranoia. Okay, but, and that, but then you had so many symptoms before that. But I, I have had patients who are taking medication for, for paranoia and their doctors were never you know, aware of that. They're vegans, or because they're vegans, they should be taking a supplement, and that's all they needed. You know, so the whole problem was just a, a vitamin B12 uh, deficiency. So it's good to be aware of that, because your doctor might tell you, oh, you know, okay, you're feeling tired and memory loss, so that's iron, because you're a vegetarian, right? so that, that must be iron. But then it, it's actually the, the B12. So, so if you're having symptoms, have it checked, make sure you know what it is. If you're not having symptoms, Start supplementing and just be aware. It's not like you're going to wake up the other day with, with you know, being paranoid. Paranoid, not, not because of that. Maybe for other reasons, right? Because we're an MRI activist, so sometimes it happens. And so to summarize, eat a wide variety of, of whole or minimally processed foods that will make sure you're getting more protein along with those calories or more nutrients along with those calories. Uh, plenty of brightly colored vegetables, uh, regular amounts of nuts and seeds for a, a person that has a, a low uh, physical activity, basic, uh, just, just basic uh, caloric consumption. Uh, what you would need is about one handful of nuts. Right? If, if you think your hands are too small for your size, then you, you want to consider what, what's a, a good size. So for myself, it would be about 50 grams. For a person my size, uh, it's, it's about 50 grams. Right? So if you're smaller, then you're going to need a little less, which will probably go along with, with your hand size. And we've already talked about all this. Only iodine might be an issue here in Europe, so it's good to talk about that. Uh, iodine will be present in foods that are grown near the ocean. So you might not know where your food is coming from. Try to find out. Otherwise, uh, make sure you have uh, 
uh, seaweed in your diet because then that comes deep from the sea. So that's going to have iodine, and one last option is to just supplement it. And the, other, the only other supplement need might be also vitamin D if you're not getting enough sunlight, either because you're not going out in the sun or because the sun is too low in your region at some time of the year. So it's just about 15 minutes. So even if you know, work inside a building, you probably walk to work or drive, you can get some sun. Uh, you ha having breakfast at home, you can let some sunlight in your back, in your arms. Uh, whatever part of your body that is equivalent to arms and face, to that much skin exposure, uh, should be enough. And oh yeah, selenium is another issue. I'm not selling Brazil nuts, uh, but it is the best source. Uh, it's an exceptional source of, of, of selenium, which is a mineral that has an important role on your immune system. If you're experiencing low immune resistance, it's likely to be zinc or selenium, okay, those, two, those two minerals. So Brazil nuts should be included one a day or seven sometime during the week, so three twice a week. It can be spread during a week, but make sure in your nut mix that you're having every week because you're trying to get those, those 50 grams of, uh, of nuts that you have some Brazil nuts as well in there. Okay, there's my contact information if you want to write me uh, anytime. And I do think we have, yes, we have 20 or 15 minutes to, for, for questions and answers. Thank you. And I will be talking tomorrow about animal rights activism, which is going to be in room B at, where is it? Animal rights activism in Brazil, by the way. 4.30, someone said. Okay, 4.30 in, in room B. Go ahead. Uh, what's about uh, vitamin B12 in uh, spiruline? Yeah, that's also a mistake. Okay. Uh, if you look at studies from, from, from the 70s and the 80s, you will find uh, soy sauce, spirulina, chlorella being pointed out as a vitamin B12 source. And when you look at earlier studies, or uh, studies that are, yeah, later studies, right? Uh, they will show you that that is not a source. What happens is that there, there are vitamin B12, they're active, and there are vitamin B12, which are analogs. So they look like vitamin B12, but they don't do what it does. So even when you measure your blood, it's going to come out as, as that, you, that you have vitamin B12, but it might be the analog. So if you're eating too much spirulina and you do a blood test, it's going to show that, that it's higher. But then if you look at other index, indexes, like the, the mean, in English, I mean, mean corpuscular volume or mean body volume, uh, well, however that's, that translates, or the homocysteine, you're going to see that those are pointing that your vitamin B12 is low, even though if you're measuring just the B12, it's going to show that it's regular, that it's too high, but that's because you're eating too much of those foods that have the analog, but they don't do what vitamin B12 will do. And the reason why the most, uh, the, the most recent tests will show that it does not, it's not the active, it's because now we can, there are tests that can differentiate so if you, if you take a manufacturer, write to your man, spirulina, uh, uh, the person who, who's selling the spirulina, and ask for the study. They're going to send you a study from the 70s or the 80s, even though there are studies from the 90s and the 2000s that show that it's not a source. But they can still claim it because they can base it on one study, one old study. Hi, George. Um, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding soya products. I've heard that there's a lot of estrogen, the hormone, in soya products. Um, is this then problematic for men to consume a lot of soya products or not? It really depends on what you mean by a lot. We don't see that in practice, but there have been in vitro or in animal studies that will show that uh, it could, uh, forget the word in English again, uh, it could produce uh, like a breast growth in men and, and issues like that. So. But we do not see that in populations that are eating a lot of soy. You don't, we don't see that in the Chinese population. We don't see that in the Japanese population. We don't see that in practice uh, at all. And, uh, but what we would consider like too much soy is above three servings per day. I'm not saying that people should have three servings or, or even two servings. servings. You, you, you can never have soy. You could be vegan and never have soy products, right? You can 
get your protein and iron from other sources. But if you have if you're having more than three servings a day, then you should start being concerned. Not not just because of the excess estrogen, but because you're eating too much of the same food, right? So then you're not getting all the variety that, that you need. But uh, I have never had, had a case in my office and in the literature, we, we, we very poorly try to prove that there's a, a problem with for, for men to be eating too much soy. Okay. So, I mean, the population communities that have been doing that for a millennium and do not have that issue. Um, hi, what is canola oil? Because that's not in Britain. Is it rapeseed oil in... Canola? Uh, yeah. yeah, rapeseed. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, there. Oh, there's lots of questions. Lots of questions. <laughs> lots of questions, okay, good. Uh, hi, um, just about uh, the... Uh, two and D3, you mentioned that only D2 is uh, vegan. Uh, in Europe, we have already D3, which is also vegan. Oh, is that so? Okay. Um, and regarding B12, what is the best test which you can do? Because the one which is done in UK, mm -hmm. it gives you B12 in your blood, but yeah. it can be B12 which has been stored in your uh, body for years. And could it be an anal analog, analog as well, right? Exactly. So, so, is, so how yeah. can you find out what's the real B12 okay. consumption which you have? Well, thanks for, for sharing the, the vitamin D information. I didn't know there was a, uh, a vegan D3 available here in Europe. And uh, for the B12, so you want to take the serum B12, which is the one that might be, give you confusing results, but it might, it is necessary, but it's gonna, because you need to cross that with the other results. Only you don't want the serum B12 by itself, right? By itself, it should, unless it's low. If, if it's low, that, then it's low. Then you know it's too low. It doesn't matter. It's low in analogs and in the real thing. But if it's, Good, you're not sure if it's good. Then you want to take the homocysteine. Homocysteine uh, is broken by vitamin B12. So too much homocysteine in your system means that you, were, you, you don't have enough B12 in your system. Right? So when the B12 is active, it's going to break the homocysteine and transform it into the amino, amino acid cysteine. And it's, it's, going to, uh, it's going to be below 10. So you want, you want your homocysteine to be below 10, that means your B12 is active. And the mean corpuscular volume, uh, which is in the basic uh, hemogram, where, where you, I'm not sure if I'm translating this right to, to the index in, in English, but it's uh, in the same test that will give you hemoglobin and, and, the, and the white series, it's gonna have the mean corpuscular volume or, or mean body volume, something like that, which, should be, which must be below 96. Okay, if it's above 96, that means the cell, the cell size is too big. And, and it is growing because it, it, it has chilero vitamin B12, and it's trying to, it's increasing in size to try and perform what it needs to, to perform because it's, it's been less efficient because it has chilero B12. So if the B12 is too low, the cell size will increase. And then, well, there, there's one uh, other test, which is the best test, but it's usually not covered by health plans, and it's, it's usually too expensive, which is the methyl malonic acid. If you can, if you can get the MMA, methyl, M-E-T-I-L, malonic, M-A-L-O-N-I-C, acid, methyl malonic acid, then you can just not care about all the other results that one would, it's, it's, it's like uh, the golden standard uh, result. Right, but you can come to a conclusion from the other tests as well, by themselves. Hi, hi, George. Thanks. Hi. Um, I was wondering, are you familiar with the eighty ten ten diet? Yeah. Um, what do you think about it, and um, how can I, for myself, um, find out how much calories a day I have to eat? Because my daughter started with it, doing sports along with it, eating 3,000 calories, which I find too much for me, and I just started a week ago doing this, eating lots of bananas, but um, I don't know the real calorie amount I need in order to lose some weight. Okay. And, and by the way, let me clarify that when I pointed out that fruits will be below the 10% uh, protein line, I didn't mean to say that a fruitarian diet or a diet mostly based in fruits is not viable. Okay, it is viable because people usually be eating then more calories than they were, and it's also complemented by, by nuts and seeds, so it is possible. 
uh, I didn't mean to criticize a, a fruit-based diet when, when I pointed that out. Um, the 80-10-10 diet she mentioned is the 80% carbohydrate, 10% uh, protein, and 10% fat diet, right? Which is very popular now, especially between raw foodists and, 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 and fruitarians. And it is viable if it is something that you can incorporate into your lifestyle. Because what happens is that you're going to need to be eating more often, because you're eating mostly raw food. And you're going to be hungry more often because it, it, yeah. it's a raw and, and, and differently from a, a, a regular crudivorous diet, crudivorous diet, right? raw food diet that has a lot of oils and, and nuts. The 80-10-10 diet would not have uh, that, that much amount of, of nuts, so you do need to, to eat uh, higher amounts. Uh, in order to, to calculate, we can, we can talk privately later. You, should, you just need to know about your, your uh, activity level and your current body weight and then make a, a calculation. But really, with, the, with an 80-10-10 diet, uh, calories is, is not the point, right? It's just, Make sure you, you're eating the food in a, in a balance that will have that characteristic and eat enough of it. You hardly be able to, to overdo it, to eat too much from a, from a diet that is... I get that. Okay. okay. Uh, good job, George. A uh, question I had is you mentioned earlier that the um, <clears throat> plants do not have cholesterol. I think it's kind of a kind of a ubiquitous that we all believe that. But I was presented with evidence a couple of weeks ago that sh that was showing that plants do have um, cholesterol, and this evidence was from a meat eater trying to show me that that it's uh, just as much as um, <clears throat> as meat. But I've been reading more and more information that's showing that plants do have cholesterol. What is your opinion on this? Have you heard about this? Um, is it uh, is it true or is there, is there... Yeah, plants, plants do not have cholesterol because cholesterol is a substance uh, produced by the liver of animals. What plants do have are, subst uh, are other substances that will... Uh, uh, Serve as the same role? That, that, stimulate, that, that will stimulate your liver to produce cholesterol, right? So then if you're eating too much uh, of the saturated fat, even if it's a vegetable saturated fat, right. like, a, like a margarine mm -hmm. uh, or palm oil, then you are stimulating your liver to produce cholesterol. So you might end up with too much cholesterol in your system, but you didn't get the cholesterol straight from the plant. You just stimulated your liver to produce it. Right, but the evidence that I've read, and it's come from, from, from research saying that plants do produce a kind of um, lubricant. Yeah. I don't know if, if, it, if it's a kind of cholesterol, but it's quite similar um, um, as far as the molecular structure, that's, it's very similar to it. Um, and as I read more and more, I don't know if it's. I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. No, yeah, but, but, I wasn't familiar with yeah. it as well either. But um, right. but what what we can say for sure is that vegans will have a lower cholesterol right. level. Usually, vegans will be in the 150 cholesterol line, which is which is the lowest you you can get. You hardly find a vegan which is not eating a lot of, of junk food, of course, because then you could be ha getting too much saturated fat. Uh, or trans fats, but if uh, you, you hardly, it's it's hardly impossible to get a vegan to be above the 200 uh, cholesterol line when they have already eliminated the cholesterol from their system, and they're eating a, a, a varied, uh, health, like natural food based diet, right? And that that's uh, I don't know maybe they on the substance that might have the same effect in vitro, or might have the same effect in animal experiments, which are always useless, I mean, animal experiments. But the, uh, the point is that, in practice, what you see is that vegans will have a lower cholesterol level. Okay. I have a question about uh, spirulina, which is uh, seaweed, so I wanted to know if that usually contains iodine. Uh, spirulina is not a seaweed, because it grows in fresh, fresh water, not, yeah, it, it, it is a, uh, it's an algae, and oh, not okay. not a seaweed, because it grows in fresh water, not in not in in, in salt water. And no, it's not it's not going to be a, a good source of iodine as much as seaweed will be. Okay, thank you. Okay. Same thing goes for chlorella, or other other fresh water like uh, 
blue, blue algae, and those are grown in fresh water. More questions? Down there. Okay. Hello. Nice one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hear kombucha has got a lot of vitamin Bs in it, B12, B6, B this, B that, and God knows what, kombucha. Um, I, don't see it, I don't see too much of it on the high street and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fermented food, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so that, that's the claim we usually see for fermented food, including soy sauce. And it's like I said, then you get one brand that, on that one study that, that they, they did at that university, they were able to show it, but then you get another brand or another process, and then you won't find the B12, or it's going to be an analog. An analog. Okay. So, I mean, the point is that we don't need to be uh, yeah. trying to find, because even if, if we found, we, we wouldn't, it, it would be harder to get every vegan to have some kombucha than to just take a pill every week, uh, a B12 pill or a fortified food. Right? So uh, I would be safer taking the, the, the B12 supplement, even if you're taking the kombucha, because that, 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 that we know for sure already, that it's going to work. Right? The kombucha might prove wrong. And, and then is it true, because I missed part of your um, lecture there, is it true that um, most people who are deficient in B12 um, are non-vegans? No, it's not. We do, we do have a, a, very high, uh, a very high deficiency uh, ratio, deficiency percentage of the, popu of the vegan population being deficient in, in vitamin B12. Yeah, we, non-vegans, uh, meat eaters, can be deficient in vitamin B12, right? But the ratio for, for vegans, yeah, at some studies in, in some communities that you look at, it's like over 50% of that community is deficient, so it's pretty serious. And it's the only one nutrient that we will not find in, in, in plant foods, right? Like, it's that one only issue that could really harm your health and make you a bad example, and, you know, people are going to say, see, that doesn't work. Uh, it's the vitamin B12, so... Yeah, and you can solve that with uh, you know, three euro a year and we, on a supplement and, and get done with it. Yeah. Uh, just one more question about B12. Um, B12 is produced by a, a bacteria. And in the past, humans did not need uh, B B12 supplement because uh, they didn't live in hy uh, hygienic uh, conditions like we do now. Right. So if people uh, eat vegetables straight from their gardens and uh, there is enough nutrition in the soil, does it mean they don't need B12? And what about people who uh, collect their mushrooms from forests? And I believe, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how good you wash the mushrooms, they will still have mm. some soil and the bacteria which are in the soil. Uh, that is a, a good hypothesis, but we cannot take that as a public health recommendation, like just eat food from, from the ground or, 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 the, or the mushrooms and don't worry about B12 anymore. Uh, because it's not just that, you also, you might have taken or be taking antibiotics at some point. You're still brushing your teeth three times or twice a, a day. Uh, you're still eating some food that came from a package, right? Uh, you were not licking yourself to, to clean up, right? If you're gonna do that with your partner, you usually want them to have taken a shower before, right? So, so is, is, you know, that was a joke. Yeah, okay, I'm glad you left. Uh, so uh, there might be some additional sources, like if you're eating contaminated food, but that's just gonna be one bit of what, of what you need, right? You're not really having a wild habit, right? So even if you go live in the woods, but you, you took your toothbrush and, and your soap with you, that you're not really living in, in a wild environment. Even if you're just eating organic food, it's still not a wild lifestyle, a wild habitat, the one that we, our species grew up. By the way, the fact that we need, uh, well, I actually didn't mention that, uh, we, the, the vitamin B12 is the one nutrient that we can store longer. It's the one nutrient that we can spend, stay more time without having any, which is, an evidence that we, during our evolution, we didn't have much of it. So why, why would our body have the ability to store it up to five years? Because we probably spent you know, three to five years without having any vitamin B12. So if we were eating animal products all the time, then we, we wouldn't need that ability to, to be storing uh, vitamin B12. Like for vitamin C, which is quite abundant, we 
we, we, don't, we can't store it for too long, right? just a few weeks, and you get uh, symptoms from vitamin C deficiency if you're not taking any vitamin C from, from your food because it's always been so available. And vitamin B12 was probably not as available because we can't store it. So I'm sorry, he had the mic. She had the, he had the microphone. Can, you can I? Yeah, I'm going to answer that. But so the question was, if you can overdose B12, I go back to him later. Okay. If he's uh, okay with it. Yeah. She asked, okay. the, the, can you overdose on on on, on B12? Uh, no, you cannot overdose on oral B12. You can overdose in with an injection. Why is that? Uh, the body needs a substance, actually needs a series of, of different substances, but the, the first one that it needs to be able to absorb B12, it's called factor R, or R factor, which is produced in the stomach. And we can only produce so much of it. Right? So if you take the whole bottle, it's, it's gonna be like you ate shock, 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 like you know, right in shock. Just something, you just ate the, the excipients, the, the part that really doesn't matter. Because if you take a pill that the size of an aspirin, you only have there 1,000 micrograms, which is one milligram. So most of the pill is actually just stuff to make volume. Could be brown rice powder, could be lactose or, or, or gelatin. So check the label to make sure it's, uh, it's a vegan uh, B12. But so the, and then after that, the R factor, you're gonna need the intrinsic factor in order for it to be absorbed. Different from other B vitamins, it's not even absorbed. Because if you take a B1, some people will use it as an insect repellent. If you take too much B1, your body's gonna absorb it, and then it realizes it was too much, and it starts expelling it. It's gonna come out on your breath, on your sweat, in your urine, and that smell will repel insects, for example. So the body actually absorbs it, and then expels it, which is the case with all other B vitamins, but not with B12, you will not even absorb it. So there's no, no problem taking too much of it. That's well, why we can give a, recommend a general recommendation mm -hmm. to just take 2,000 a week. And yeah, that's why we're going to ask you something similar to that because um, I hear that you only need a very small, small amount of um, B12, a couple of micrograms. So I just wondered then, um, it, would it be advisable really to take supplements from you've just had the one, if it's going to last you like three years, apparently you can store it for three years before you start feeling deficient and all that. So, but I'm, a mate of mine, he's showed me his supplements and I've thought, well, it's you only need a very, very small amount and it can last you for like up to three. Yeah, the, the, the 2,000, the, the 1,000 twi twice a week uh, is a good protocol to, uh, uh, where, where you can be safe if you're starting from, from a good status. It can last for three years. Last you three haven't years. taken it for three years. Um, I, I hear that it can last for up to three years. Yeah, your storage, yeah. your body can store up to five years. We usually will see symptoms after three years of someone not supplementing or eating any fortified foods. It will usually be after three years, but it's not like you can supplement for this month and then be okay for the next three years. It's not like that, no? No. No, it's not like you, you can take it, okay, like well, store it for a month and then, and then be okay, right? You need to be taking it for many years to then oh, yeah, yeah, stay yeah. three years Every without two weeks, it. take a supplement, yeah. Me again. Um, yeah. I'm missing one point in this discussion, which I always find um, difficult for or, or vegans forget about, is vegan children and B12. Uh -huh. um, I always find that vegans miss out on the point that B12 is important for us all. And then when they have children, they don't care about them too. And especially for children, it's uh, very um, important to supplement because they don't have that... Um, Storage. That's storage. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It is. It is important. Uh, vitamin B12, omega-3, and folic acid are very important. Uh, you can get the omega-3s from, from, from the, the flaxseed oil. You can get the... Um, you, you can, well, the vitamin D, of course, will be coming from the sun exposure to, to the mother and, and to the children. But the, the vitamin B12 needs to be supplemented. And even if the mother has a good vitamin B12 status... Uh, the body will not, uh, both for the milk or the fetus, the body will not use as efficiently the B12 that is already in the system as it will use, as it will re redirect to, to the fetus and to the milk, the new vi vitamin B12 that comes in. So a good vitamin B12, B12 storage level is not enough if you were pregnant or, or breastfeeding or even planning to, to, to become pregnant. And the difference of the consequences for, for a child or for an adult is that 
if you become B12 deficient as an adult, you were experience some memory loss, be fatigued, lose your job, but then you can always look for another job, right? When you when you when you're good again. Uh, for 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 a, for a ch a children or an infant especially or, or the fetus, uh, it's going to lose something that it cannot go back to. Right? It, it's going to uh, it's going to lose, it's going to miss on on its neurological development. It's not, and it's something that's not going to he's not going to catch up. So if it develops dementia because it was B12 deficient during pregnancy, it's not like it's going to overcome dementia when 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 it's older. Or if it, it same thing for iron deficiency, for example. The child who, uh, who is iron deficient is not going to grow if it's in a, in a growth period. It's not going to grow during those weeks or, or those months. And it, it's actually, the child's actually going to be shorter, uh, a few centimeters or whatever fraction that it didn't grow during that period. Uh, so for, for, for our children, for children it's much more serious because it's not something that you can just uh, because it's forming its neurological system, and we as adults we're just maintaining our system, but children are forming it. So uh, if they lose growth, they're going to have lost it forever. Okay, so it's it's very uh, important to to make sure you get enough B12 during pregnancy and during breastfeeding, and then uh, at the food on the food once the child starts eating. What time we have? Time is up, but I'm good. I can stay here as long as they won't kick us out. Unless someone says that there's food outside, then everyone's going to come out. There will be, for sure. Hi. Um, I don't take any medication right now, but I'm thinking about taking maybe supplement B12. Yeah. Uh, and I saw outside some pills which had uh, several kinds of supplements in one pill. Um, so I was wondering if I should go to a doctor first to check if I have any deficiency mm -hmm. or just take the pills with all kinds of uh, supplements. Yeah. The multivitamins c c could be a, a self-medication thing because they're usually uh, at a, a dose that is not, that is not too, too risky, too high. But it, it might also be pain for a lot of things that you don't need. Right? You, you might actually be causing some imbalances because you're taking too much of A that's going to cause your body to expel B, which is what, what was low for you. So it's always best to have something that is custom made for you that's going to look at your deficiencies. But in general, multivitamins, they could at the most be a waste of money, but not really cause serious problems. Unless you're talking about, say, you're going to take an iron supplement and you don't have any iron deficiency, because then that's one supplement that you could could overdo you. The body has no ability to expel iron. So if you're taking too much, it's going to be in, in, in your system. But that, that's why usually those uh, non-prescription supplements will either not have iron or have very low doses of iron because they know that people are going to, uh, might overdo it, right? So, so they're usually safe, but it's best if you, if you take in one on your own. If you're going to take something forever, all your life, you only need the B12 vitamin. You don't need to get the multivitamin. I think, oh, since I'm going to pay for it anyway, let me, let me buy the other one that has the other stuff. You, you, you're likely not needed if you're eating a, a variety of fresh, plant-based foods. And if you're not getting it, the supplement is not the solution. Right? It might be a first-minute thing until you get your diet organized or, or something. But if, if, you're, if you're eating, you know you're eating too, too little calcium or... or or, or too little iron or too little zinc, what you really need to do is to uh, correct your diet and not just take the supplement as, and, and for life, you know, as a, as a balancing factor. Just a quick one here. Um, where does it come from, B12, when they're putting in the supplements? How do they make it? From bacteria. It's synthesized bacteria. from bacteria. Yeah, it's never taken from, from animal's blood or, or, or animal's flesh. It's, it's just so easy and clean and just... You can do the whole process uh, uh, tr trouble-free if you're doing a, a bacteria culture than if you're transporting blood or liver from from the abattoir to to be processed and cleaned. It just never happens in the industry. Okay. Hi. 
Hi. Um, you were just saying uh, something about uh, B12 overdose and injections. Is it? Uh, I didn't hear it. Yeah, I said uh, you can overdose with injections because okay. then the body has no choice to absorb it or not. When you inject, you're injecting it into your muscle. It's an yeah. intramuscular. So then you, then you can overdo it, yeah. You okay. should never take a B12 shot unless you, you're really deficient in B12. Okay, thank you. But with the oral dose, you can take it just, just to make sure, right? Because then if you, your body will know if it doesn't need it and it won't absorb it. No more questions? No more? Okay, well, I'll be here. Thank you very much. All three days, if you have any more. Thank you.